Uh, I'm Lila Semborain and I curate this series since a long time ago. Even from the beginning, Cecilia has been a guest here. Uh, I, I think you came the, for the first time maybe in 2006 or a long time <coughs> ago. So, and Rosa has been a guest also before, a couple of times, presenting her book and documentaries. So um, I'm very happy to host today this first event again with Ugly Duckling. Ugly Duckling also has presented some of the books here. Um, we are very happy that um, the writing, the poetry in Spanish is being translated, but well, Cecilia is a different case because we don't know in what language she writes. So, even we don't know if she writes in any language because <laughs> her language is vowels maybe only, you know, and expressions of the body and of, of sound many times. And I think it's very exciting to have also Rosa here who did a magnificent job uh, trying to translate these completely unpredictable sounds that Cecilia makes and that she has managed to put together in a wonderful book that we are presenting today, which is Speed Temple, you have it there. The design always in Ugly Duckling is impeccable and very subtle. So it's fantastic that uh, all of you are here tonight and uh, I have nothing, I don't have anything else to say okay. to thank you because it's very cold today and you are here but it will be very warm soon with the voices of Cecilia and Rosa. I don't want to mention all the books and all the things that they have published because probably you will get the book that it will be sold outside when we are having a drink and we get you drunks so you can buy our books. <laughs> so uh, Rosa will say some words now about her experience translating or translating, I don't know if that's the word, transcribing or translating Cecilia Vicuña's performances for many, many years. And um, actually I met Rosa through Cecilia also, which is I always try to say that it creates a, like a big community of writers and as I am in the Creative Writing in Spanish program, I'm very happy that our program also can be in contact with the wonderful work that is being produced here in New York. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lila, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my voice is not that great, um, but I'll, <clears throat> I'll try. You can you can understand me, right? I can't I can't hear myself too well, so it's a little bit difficult. So, this book is um, ten years in the making. Cecilia said in in a last invitation that it was twelve years in the making. Um, so I think the myth grows. We're just going to keep adding years to it. But it was a long time. I started uh, the book in, in Buffalo, and it's really incredible that Ugly <coughs> Duckling took it on, and they made it something um, beyond any and all of my expectations. It's a beautiful book. Anna Moshkovakis um, especially just worked with me and I think kept me calm through much of the process. Um, and so thank you. Thank you, Ugly Duckling. And of course, thank you, Cecilia, for letting me... Um, spend a lot of time in your apartment. Um, a lot of I attempt in Wall Street while I was doing it. I mean, I would work and I would look at some of her archives and things like that. So um, I'm really happy. And then a lot of the contributors, there's only one contributor here, I think, Rodrigo Tostano. Is there anyone else who contributed to the book that I don't see? No. <clears throat> so, and of course, thank you for the King Juan Carlos Center for having us. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about um, why I did this book, how it came about. 
And I, what I'm going to do is begin by reading, and I'm going to start a little timer here, since I'm going to speak extemporaneously for the most part. So I'm going to read the first part of um, this anecdote that um, initiates the introduction. <clears throat> Gathered with dozens of people in a small library at Brown University, too small, in fact, for the number who have shown up, I wait for the invited poet to approach the podium. There has been the usual introduction and applause, but after several minutes of silence, she is nowhere in sight. As I nervously scan the room looking for her, the silence gives way, gives way to the sound of audience members shifting uncomfortably in their seats. Then, at the height of tension, singing, a cluster of vowels really, begins to rise up from somewhere among the rows of chairs, first quietly, then growing louder and more persistent, until it seemingly permeates even the library's polished wood. Cecilia Vicuña emerges from within the audience, having wrapped wool thread around those sitting next to her. Continuing her high-pitched chant, she slowly and deliberately approaches the podium, pulling the thread behind her. Relieved, I expect her, despite the unusual entrance, to introduce herself, say a few words, and begin reading from, unraveling, from the unraveling of words and the weaving of water, the book that prompted the event in progress. In fact, I organized this reading on the strength of her book, knowing little about her, and there are poems I'm hoping she'll read, some favorites she might explain into which she might offer insight Still, she's not reading, at least not in the usual sense. Instead, she sings, chants, whispers, navigates a registry of sounds, swiftly <coughs> moving between languages, Spanish and English, perhaps others I don't recognize. With her voice and intonation, she explores the musicality within words, changing their very meaning. Or she becomes quiet, compelling us to listen to the birds singing outside of the library. So, to, so that in the absence of her voice, we listen to what's present at the edges of the university. There are books and papers in front of her, but this is, without a doubt, not a poetry reading in the usual sense, an oral reproduction of text on the page framed by anecdotal remarks performed with that reading voice so familiar to us all. And while I expect her to read poems written in Spanish, then equitably offer their English translations, her movement between languages is less than predictable. I keep listening for the poems that I remember, and maybe I recognize a phrase or an idea now and again, but so much of it, I think, must simply be poetry I've not yet read. I can't say for sure if what I've just experienced is a poetry reading. I only know I am sure that it is poetry. So that was in 1995 when I was a student at Brown and I invited Cecilia because I'd read her book and knew nothing about her. So the performance was really a surprise. I didn't know anything and I'd been to very few performances, I mean, very few poetry readings to begin with. Um, and we became friends after that. Um, I would go to visit her in New York and then I started translating her work when we both went to Scotland together. She went to do an installation there and I translated a small book. Um, and despite the fact that I was translating her for a while, it didn't occur to me that there was a real disconnect between her performances and the poetry on the page. Um, and it was very curious to me that her poetry looked so different on the page, this kind of very contained, you know, sparse writing compared to the kind of um, porousness, right, or openness um, and improvisatory nature of her performances. Um, so I started asking her about it, and I said, well, Cecilia, what, what exactly do you do in the performances? What is, are you reading off the page? Because sometimes the books were there, but she wasn't looking at them, right? So she'd have the book there, but she'd be doing this other thing, and, um, or she'd have little pieces of paper, and she said, well, I call those quasars. She had never said this before. Right? And this is what's interesting about Cecilia's performances, is that so many people have written about her conceptual art, her installations, um, her visual art, her printed poetry. But the performance really hasn't been talked about. I think this is one of the reasons the, the book is necessary. Um, and I really think that the key to all her work is in the performance. And yet, and I think this is why it's so important, is that she's very 
She has been up until now very reluctant to talk about it. I mean, I had known her for many years before the, the word quasar came up. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a section in here that's called Poetics of Performance. There are two poems in which she talks about what the quasar is, and I'm just going to uh, quote briefly. She says, um, <clears throat> the quasar looks, quote, for a form before the form. A poem only becomes poetry when its structure is made not of words, but forces. The quasar is not a, these are my words now, the quasar is not a tangible thing, a poem or story to be told, but a process of discovery that allows the evolving elements of the performance to manifest. Bakunya has also referred to the quasars as not yet poems or quasi poems, which suggests that what manifests in these oral performances reveals threads that may later be pulled into the future design of a written poem as a result, the poem sometimes moves from performance to page rather than the conventional movement from page to performance. Um, and so when I asked her um, about these quasars and, and how she sort of develops, this, you know, is it just improvisation? What does she use? And she leads me over to a filing cabinet and there were folder after folder of performance notes that I didn't know about. And I think she never, she never published them was incredible, and I'm going to show them to you um, a little bit later on, but these really beautiful performance notes, I mean, they look like art. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> I was just trying to remember who published this time, why can't I think of it? Kelsey Street Press, right? So, the, the drawings in Kelsey Street Press really look like her performance notes, and that's really how the book began, is looking at her archives and seeing all of these notes and seeing that Within these notes were also altered poems, poems that she had altered prior, but then continued to be altered in performance, right, in situ. Um, and of course, I knew about her thread installations, and I knew that she'd used a thread, but it <coughs> occurred to me while doing the research <coughs> that the reason the performances are the core is that that's where the real weaving takes place, right, the weaving of all these elements, of so the singing, the written poetry, the... Um, the elements of the present, right? Things that, that can't be controlled, like that bird at Brown University that was singing outside where she stopped. I never had anyone do that in a poetry reading, to just stop and say, let's listen to the bird, right? This was so strange to me. But then as I, as I transcribed, this, the majority of this book are transcriptions of performances, because there's nothing else, I mean, I'll tell you in a second how I got all of these tapes to transcribe, but there was, there was nothing. I mean, now there's some things online, but, but when I started, nothing. I noticed that there was um, a pattern there. Right? There was a pattern of the way that she drew things together. There were certain themes, disappearance, debris, um, uh, all of these different sort of ideas that connected the performances together. Um, and so I thought transcription, and I had studied at, in Buffalo under Dennis Tedlock, who had done transcriptions himself, um, was the way to sort of get these ideas across, right? To have them for other people to read and to engage um, in these performances, right? So <clears throat> Cecilia let me look at a bunch of, she had videotapes that different centers had given to her, places where she had performed. And they were in the back, in a back closet, covered in dust, you know. And this, many of them were poorly recorded. Um, so I had to listen to them, and I picked a few. And there were some in the book where it was completely inaudible. I couldn't hear anything. Um, but I included the performance notes for those, because I thought that um, the performance notes were interesting in and of themselves, and they're accompanied by essays. So the contributors were people who were in the audience the day of the performance. So we, were, we located, for example, um, Rodrigo uh, did the one for Pierogi Gallery um, in Brooklyn. And so we located all these people, poets and thinkers and artists who had been present to write essays so that we'd get a sense of what it was like to be there. And I did supply them with some notes if they wanted them or some videos if they, you know, if they wanted them, things like that. But for the most part, I wanted their memory and their experience of it to come into play. So there's sort of Juliana Spar and Maria Damon and various other people. 
So what I wanted to do as well is <clears throat> show you some other elements of the book. I asked um, Cecilia to give me a uh, autobiography and performance. It's a sort of the trajectory of her her life as a performer, as an artist. And so I'll show you some uh, photographs from that and sort of explain some of them. So the first one is probably um, Cecilia's first performance ever, and this here she is at two years old. <laughs> That's uh, Cecilia with Rooster. She says that it was her first boyfriend. <laughs> she doesn't seem too interested, though, I don't think. So that's, that's in Chile. And then um, a little bit later on, this is with um, El Tribuno. So Cecilia was, um, in the beginning, uh, primarily a visual artist, but also involved in poetry. Um, and this was a group of friends and artistic collaborators. Um, called the Tribuno, and we include the manifesto that Cecilia wrote. Um, and they, they were a very interesting group. They, they infiltrated a, uh, a writer's conference that they weren't invited to. Um, <clears throat> here's another picture with Claudio Bertoni, which I love. Very psychedelic, right? This is um, this is Cecilia in London in 1972. She went. She received a, a scholarship from the British Council to go to the um, Slade School of the Arts. Is that right? And here she was giving. She was reading a, a letter by um, imprisoned artists, imprisoned by um, the uh, Pinochet uh, government, and this was part of. Um, the Artist Festival for Democracy in Chile at the Royal College of Art in London in 1974. And she traces this, she says this is really the beginning of her performance style. She was asked at this time, because she was a Chilean in London, to go to art schools and to go and, and to speak at um, uh, gatherings of uh, unions, uh, labor unions, and to talk about the, um, the Chilean struggle. So, and she was also talking about socialism before the coup. So they wanted to know about sort of the socialist project and then the coup. So this really sort of made her a speaker. It was the first time when she had to go and sort of talk in front of people. That's a poster for the Arts Festival for Democracy in Chile. These I love. I know Anna really loved these two. These are uh, the stickers that they made. Um, Artists for Democracy. Artists for Democracy um, was named by Cecilia and it was a, a group in response to the Chilean coup. And then in 1975 she left for um, Bogota, Colombia. And this is, the next performance is one that's been written about quite a bit, The Milk Crime or El Crimen Lechero. So this is a um, an announcement um, in, in an article in a newspaper in Colombia, and this was a um, 1,920 children were poisoned by contaminated milk. Um, and so <coughs> Cecilia um, did a performance. She was um, asked to be a part of a performance that was going to take place in Santiago, in Chile, uh, Toronto, and Colombia, in Colombia. And it was part of the Colectivo de Acciones de Arte. Um, and it was a project called Para No Morir de Hambre en el Arte. And interestingly, even though, I mean, this, the Colectivo de, de Acciones de Arte has been written about this, you know, within the history of, of performance art in Latin America, but I've yet to find Cecilia mentioned in that history. But we have evidence here that she did the performance, right? Here it is. Um, and there are several pictures that, um, that are in the book as well. So then in 1980, she moves to New York, um, forms part of the Heresies Collective, um, does some readings here, and her um, performance style continues to evolve. So she's not really singing yet as she does now. 
she was going around the, the countryside in Colombia and performing her poetry. Um, so she was writing more poems, and, and I think her, she began to write more after the Chilean coup. Um, but when she gets to New York, she starts doing something that she describes in the book, where she's showing these um, uh, slides of mochique and priestesses, and she begins to improvise. She begins to look for the poem that's not there. So she begins to add words to what she sees on the slides. And we see later in the book, there's a performance at, um, in Craner Art Center, and it's a lecture. So there are two categories of transcriptions here, or I should say two categories of performances that I transcribe. One is the poetry performance, and the other one is the performance lecture. So one of the lectures, she does something very similar, where she has various slides and improvises as she's looking at the slides. And I, th I think the lectures are very interesting because at least in poetry, we sort of give this sort of idea of, you know, poetic license or, you know, performers can do a thing, but the lecture space is even more sanctified, right? That you're supposed to have this argument and her argument evolves. If you hear it, there are arguments, there are several arguments, but it's not a totalizing argument, right? It's one that goes in a lot of different directions. So I thought it was important to include those because I think simultaneously, um, while I was transcribing this, she was beginning to write more um, poet poem essays <coughs> that I was uh, translating. So she would write these poems that were really essays that contained arguments um, about various things, and I thought that was sort of that movement, I feel like she was trying that out first, sort of in the performance space, and then it arrived at the page. She started, I think, I could be wrong about that, but it feels like it moved from the performance onto the page at some point. So, <clears throat> this is a performance at Barnard in 1996. This is not one that was transcribed because all we have are photos, but I wanted to include it because it's such a beautiful photo, right? And there's, um, you know, a woman with black hair, one with blonde. She weaves their hair together. Um, you see this thing that um, is uh, a connecting thread, uh, no pun intended, in Cecilia's work, which is the use of thread, right? Tying, tying herself to the audience, having the audience tied to each other. It was kind of weaving where the elements of the performance are woven, right? The singing, the chanting the stories, the poems, the altered stories, all of this, but also that there's this kind of ceremonial um, element, too, that the thread is a part of, where she, even before she begins performing, that thread kind of brings her together, brings the audience members and her together. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a lot of uh, stills from from films and unfortunately at the last minute we couldn't use it because the resolution was so low but I'm so in love with these stills that I wanted to show them so this is from um, Hall Walls uh, in Buffalo in 1998 and I think what's remarkable about this is that there are various narratives that she improvises in here and as she tells these narratives the thread which becomes sort of part of involuntary gesture. She has it hanging from her finger. And as she speaks, the thread goes up and down. But strangely, or coincidentally, the narrative becomes almost animated by this thread. So at one point, I'll show you one here. See that one? See the thread that's hanging from her finger? So this is, this is a part of the performance where she's telling the story of a woman who um, gets lost. She's walking through the mountains and she gets lost. And her son finds her by following the, the threads that her shoes leave behind. Right? So these are, these are sort of like shoes made out of rope. right? So these threads that her shoes leave behind, he follows them and he finds her. So it's referencing this thread, right? The thread that is there, sort of present, the thread that we follow, the maternal thread, the maternal line, right? But she also says that the woman survives alone because she's able to drink water from animal hooves. The rain had accumulated in these hollows from the animal hooves, and she drinks 
the water. So right there, she's making the gesture of drinking the water. But then you see that little stream becomes the water. Right? So some of these things are planned, and some aren't. Obviously, she brings the thread with her. But in, there were so many moments that felt so sort of miraculous, right? That at the moment that she's saying these things, these other elements are coming together. Or when she tells stories that, you know, she mentioned some noise of the, um, you know, of, of some monster that's eating the Indians, and then there's this loud noise coming from the outside, from New York, right? Um, <clears throat> that's the beach stucco. So then, I'm going to show you the, <clears throat> these are the performance notes which I just, we, we reproduced quite a few of them. They're really beautiful. I don't know how anybody can follow these, right? Um, but she does, and a lot of them are like that, with kind of arrows, there's another one, going to different places. And I really think that that's um, its own form of visual art and poetry. Um, <clears throat> and... So one of the things that I found interesting as I was transcribing them is even though there are different elements that can be categorized, chanting, singing, narrative, poetry, right? the narratives are clearly these stories that are developed. Um, there are some notes to the stories. I mean, you can find some of the performance notes coincide with the stories that she develops, right? that she improvises in the present. There's obviously, there are poems, and when you look at the book, there are footnotes to where they appeared in print. They've been altered or changed often in the instant. Um, all of these elements can be categorized, but when you're in the performance, you can't tell where one ends and the other begins, right? That's how tight the weave is. And I was thinking of um, Irving Goffman in Frame Analysis calls, you know, episodic conventions, these things that demarcate when something ends and something begins like a gavel, like a judge's gavel. You can't tell when a poem ends and a story begins and vice versa. I mean, she doesn't, she, she rarely tells you the titles of her poems, right, which is an episodic convention. Here's the title. Or uh, preambles, right? Oh, this, I wrote this poem when I was in Rome, you know, whatever. That doesn't happen either. It's interesting this way that it's almost seamless from, from beginning to end. And I tried to capture, because in print it's very hard to capture the movement from singing, but we used different fonts. We had some limitations and we didn't want to, and I, I agreed with Anna, overwhelm the page with too many fonts, but I think that we captured um, how to, I, I feel like I captured the movement from um, one intonation or voice and another, right? Or when the voice gets louder. And this has a lot to do with my training with Dennis Tedlock. Um, <clears throat> and I think the final thing, I'm at 23 minutes, which is perfect. Um, this is what I planned. The final thing I wanted to tell you, and there's, there's a lot more. I mean, I said to Cecilia that it was very hard for me to cut this down to, to 20 minutes, but um, thankfully, there's the introduction that I hope I hope you'll read to the book. Um, why is it called Spit Temple? So right before I came up here, uh, Rodrigo wanted to know who came up with the name Spit Temple, and I told him, now is not the time to tell me you don't like it, right? And what did you say? You said you're not suicidal. Right. Yeah, good. So Spit Temple came about... Um, there's a poem by Cecilia that I translated, and I'll, I'll just read it very quickly. It's called um, Yapadak. This is a new translation, but I translated it for um, a book called Cloudnet, um, in, I think in 98. It says, to song the waters of wailing break, they will mediate pitch, a fertile rite, a little broken pitcher. Song opens a heavy portal, smash it in. It's time to decant to begin eating the fractured song, Spit Temple, to never return. And so I'm going to finish by reading um, a little bit about 
what that poem means and why I decided to use the Temple. The title of this book, Spit Temple, is derived from my translation of a poem Bakunya wrote and published in the catalog for her CloudNet exhibition. Iyapanthak, the poem's title, and the word contained in it, Iyapa, refers to the oldest deity in Andean myth whose name, quote, condenses thunder, lightning, and thunderbolt, end quote, and is therefore known to control fluidity and rain. This deity is also the supreme mediator of sound and can go by the name Pachakuti, world reverser. The poem here in a new translation describes the fertile and transformative powers of song, which can break open the vessel of creation, launching a series of changes from which there is no return. This poem condenses then to Vicuña's own poetics, to sing the text, to break it open, to unpack and mediate what is found there is to open up a space for possibility. It is also meant to reflect the ways in which Vicuña's oral performances challenge not only the sanctity of the poetry reading, but also that of the printed text, consecrating and desecrating them equally as a means to explore the borders between them. Central to this exploration is Vicuña's notion of the precarious, which suggests that to venerate the text, to pray to and for it, is to, quote, expose it to hazards, end quote. This tension between danger and possibility inherent in the precarious gestures towards Mary Douglas's claim that, quote, sacred, sacred rules are thus merely rules hedging divinity off, and uncleanness is the two-way danger of contact with the divinity. The paradox, Douglas points out, is at the very root of sacred, the Latin sacer, which has this meaning of restrict, quote, has this meaning of restriction through pertaining to the gods, and in some cases may apply to desecration as well as to consecration, end quote. According to Douglas, this hedging off or demarcation of what is sacred and profane varying from culture to culture can also be located in the body, which, like all structures, is most dangerous and vulnerable at its margins, its orifices, tear ducts, and pores. In performance, the text, clean, contained, solid on the page, becomes contaminated by the voice of the performer, spit and air mixing to form words that then dissolve in the air and come in contact with and enter the listener. Thank you.
Oh. 
puasa. Rodrigo Toscano is present here and he's the man of the Latin, of the Latin language. Only Rodrigo would write a poem saying quan, quantum, conquian, quantus, quantus, ut, ubi, ubi, ibi, kaki, koki, kuki, koki. Anactic, galactic, new. Why say, Jim said, do not pronounce it quasi. I pronounce it quasi. I could not. Quasi, quasi. Quasi. Very distant from a very ancient time in the history of the universe. They tend to inhabit the center of young galaxies. They are the most powerful, luminous, energetic objects in the moon. The mean number. What can that do? It makes the dark galaxies glow. Then Rosa discusses in her introduction a question that can share with both of Is this an improvisation or is it not an improvisation? <laughs> 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 In the proviso, the proviso is another line. Proviso, in este proviso, dice mi papá que es un abogado, y en este proviso, sí, en este otro, no. Invent composer said without preparation, says the dictionary. To make or provide, that's different. Provide from available materials, in that case, I am an improviso. You are the available. <laughs> <laughs> if you were here, I wouldn't do anything. It is you who are made. I'm only just the little problem. An Italian se dice to me proviso. They all be doing the repent. Something unforeseen. Something that in, in is not. It provisos. Porque for sees, she sees before and that's when this little crazy little book came about. <laughs> Julie Phillips Brown thinks that she's totally crazy, that she being she. You know that that little thing is this little when you look at your with either good eyes or a unconscious in the middle, a magnified glass. What you see is the same structure of the God. And not only that, but you see when you think of the word before a hand. One day there was an article in the New York Times. And what this article said is that it had been discovered that you know before knowing. Therefore, somebody is going to introduce you to a person and says, um, I want you to meet Rosa Alpala. And in that moment, something in you knows immediately is Rosa. If Rosa is going to be good or bad. <laughs> this knowledge travels from your brain into your hands before your hand. <laughs> so how could the person who invented the word before that knowledge was unanticipable and that you, something in your brain, knew before you knew you were knowing the knowing. So this is the little drawing book of all I made to all that beforehand, that is now traveling 
It's like all of your hands. Don't ever do <laughs> Just 
three numbers. Two degrees is the first. What the world has agreed to let the warming of the planet go. Two degrees. With one degree which we already got to, we have melted the Arctic. Imagine what two degrees will do. Number two. Cinco, seis, cinco, five, six, five gigatons of carbon. If we can burn just this amount of carbon, we will reach the two degrees before 15 years, two years to live. And the third number on this, according to Mark, given is the worst. Dos mil ochocientos gigatons. Two thousand and eight hundred. Two thousand and eight hundred. Is the fossil fuel in reserve still in the ground? If we let it burn, if no Está difícil. Bueno, yo una, más que una pregunta o un comentario, es 
felicidades por la performance, la verdad que la disfruto mucho. Un comentario que tiene que ver con ella tangencialmente. ¿no? Tengo, hay un científico japonés que me interesa mucho, eh, físico, Emoru Masato, cuyos experimentos no sé si conoces, me imagino, me imagino que sí. Y bueno, para el público un poco lo que hace este hombre, eh, emite vibraciones, sonidos eh, en, al agua, dirigidos a un recipiente con agua y luego estudia las moléculas y las reacciones que tienen lugar en, en estos contenidos, ¿no? Entonces, pues un poco su estudio va dirigido eh, para comprobar o verific verificar que cuando el, el estímulo tiene es positivo se le, se le aplica el agua cierto, eh, ciertas palabras con valores semánticos positivos como paz un ejemplo, eh, las moléculas pues, se reconfiguran de manera bastante orgánica, armónica, y cuando tiene lugar el efecto contrario, o el input... Oh, sorry, I should have been saying this in English. Well, basically, I was, I was asking um, Cecilia if she, or how she understands these experiments by a physicist uh, from Japan, Emoru Masaro, who works with water, and he gives input into the water, And um, basically, he studies how the water molecules are reconfigured through this input. And like, of course, the water doesn't know what we're saying to it, but it uh, reacts in a certain way. And um, she she knows what I'm talking about, so maybe she can explain. My question is, how do you interpret what he's doing, and how that maybe relates to your work? Yeah, I'm familiar with the work of Masaru Moto, and I think it's, it's really beautiful. And um, it's like uh, bringing into the scientific language something that <coughs> ancient cultures have known always. You know, and for example, in Chile, I was in Chile in January, and I found a book by an amazing uh, German scientist called Schum. And this guy uh, was writing. Uh, oh, did you hear me? Oh, so I, I did the whole performance without you hearing? <laughs> <laughs> you were so polite. <laughs> And um, yeah, um, this German scientist called Schrenk uh, was writing similar things but in a more poetic way um, in the 40s and 50s. And, and this book was translated in Buenos Aires maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but I just found it. And what it says is something that I have seen many other scientists say more recently, which is that the, the molecular structure of water is a total mystery because it's like an impossibility. How is a molecule of hydrogen and one of oxygen come together? It's completely unknown and it's not really possible to do it, and yet they have joined. So this idea of a conflict of something that is impossible and makes life possible at the same time. It's really very, very powerful. What are you seeing? Something disturbs you? Yeah, a sound. In the molecule. Maybe your computer? No, okay. Ah, it's a cell phone. No, it's not a cell phone. It's a rumbling noise coming from the outside. Maybe somebody's moving papers also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this, this idea that this molecular impossibility makes life possible, it's really appealing and it makes communication. Everything you know in the planet is communicated and moves through water. So this communica communicative ability of water has been known forever. Uh, and people, for example, in the Andes, you find these pyramids. And these pyramids have sort of inner channels and through these inner channels, they threw water. And so the water moved inside the pyramid and the whole pyramid became a musical instrument so that the sacredness of the place was transmitted to the whole land by this incredible sound. So this was done thousands of years ago. And like that, you can find lots of examples. Um, but I think the most important part of the message of Yamoto is that because we are water, everything that you say to yourself 
you are water is picking up and every molecule in your body is responding to the negativity of your thoughts. I know that because I'm a very negative person. And, you know, <laughs> I have, I'm totally hooked, I'm an addict to negativity. I want to go badly and everything like that. And I have a t-shirt and this t-shirt is the most wonderful woman. She's almost 90 years old and she's always making fun of me. And she says, that's the rumbling noise. It was preparing to come up the air conditioning. <laughs> and so she was interviewed along with a number of like 15 sages on TV and everybody had all these complex uh, things to say except she. She shows up and she says, whatever I do, it turns out right. You know? And I thought, that's it. <laughs> that's the best policy. And that will change your water. Okay. Hi. I was just thinking about this quote, for some reason, during your performance, um, i just read it because it just was worrying me. I'm talking about, you said negativity, so I was bringing it up. But it's, um, there are two ways to worry words. One is hoping for the greatest possible beauty in what is created. The other is to tell the truth. That's from June Jordan, who just at the bottom of an email I got today. I was thinking about it for some reason during your performance because the way it's so beautiful, but it's so telling the truth at the same time. I, think that I just wondered if you needed to kiss. There are two ways to worry words. One is hoping for the greatest possible beauty in what is created. The other is to tell the truth. What do you think? <laughs> is it worry words? I see. Um, well, I think the two are one. Because um, how can you... Um, this is an Andean idea and it, it's not really an Andean idea, it comes to me as Andean just because I'm an Andean animal. But in truth this idea goes back to the first people who had thoughts that were transmitted to us, meaning from Africa. So these people were already thinking this kind of thought in Africa, maybe 140,000 years ago. And the idea that two is one and one is two. So is it beauty diverse or different from truth? How can that be? 